classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is... Okay, we will start again. Uh, this will be the ISP on statistical <coughs> mechanics getting to liquids. The assumption is you haven't had statistical mechanics before. You have heard of classical mechanics, at least the freshman level as I teach it, um, or intermec or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's based on my book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics which you will have, since we seem to be short of classroom space, and this is my office, um, I will ha occasionally have to point at equations, and you will follow me in the book. <coughs> okay, having said that, let us begin at the beginning. And today we're going to look at pieces of chapters 1 through 3. Actually, the book calls them Lectures 1 through 3. And as it was written, those actually were originally lectures, hour and a half lectures in a... 14 week grad course. Okay, so we start out, and the instruction is please do not eat the molecular models while I am talking. So here we have a representative atom. And the problem we're going to look at is the question how do we calculate the force of the atom on the wall of the room, that is, the gas pressure? And so if we just had this, so there is a wall atom. Here are several wall atoms. And here is an atom of the gas. We might say there is a wall atom. There is an atom of gas. They have a potential energy. The derivative of the potential energy is going to be the force on the wall and the force on the atom. Um, and therefore, if we know the wall atom potential energy, we can calculate the force that this atom is putting on the wall. So far, so good. Unfortunately, there are a few minor technical complications. The quantum mechanics calculation, which is not trivial, is that the wall is composed of a whole bunch of atoms, and the assumption that potential atoms are simply, potential energies, I mean, are simply additive is not a valid assumption. And if you think back to physics 2, the Coulomb potential is additive. You have Q1, Q2 over R as the potential energy. And if I have several charges, you have to add those up. But the fact there are extra charges there has no effect on the potential energy of two charges. Um, well, that is not a good assumption for forces between atoms. And if you actually have more than two atoms present, you have what are called three-body forces, four-body forces, and so on. But if you work hard, you can calculate those. And therefore, you can say there is a potential energy between the atom and the wall. It may depend exactly where the atom is above the wall. But there's a potential energy and there's a force. Unfortunately, life is not quite this simple, and I'm going to keep referring repeating this phrase on a regular basis. First of all, this room contains more than one atom in its atmosphere. If there's only one atom in here, we'd have trouble breathing, and you'd have trouble hearing me. Um, and therefore, if you wanted to calculate the force on, all of, on the wall due to all of the atoms, you would have to repeat this calculation for all of the atoms in the room. Now, there are, I don't know, 10 to the 26, 10 to the 27, some dismayingly large number of atoms in the room. Uh, and so even if you say, gee, the potential energy goes to zero after a bit, there must be 10 to the 24 or some huge number of atom-wall interactions. And so you would have to repeat the calculation numerically 10 to the 24 times, <clears throat> which would require a great deal of paper and pencil. Alternatively, if you try to do this on a computer, well, I am looking at an accelerator board for my computer, which will de deliver a teraflop floating point single precision. You can now get those. But um, 
even so, that's 10 to the 12 floating points per second. That is either 10 to the 12 or something seconds, or you need an awful lot of computers. So there's already a problem because the number of atoms is not small. Now we hit the next problem. Um, we are not at absolute zero, and as you sort of heard in high school physics or earlier, if you have a gas not at absolute zero, all of the atoms are moving. So if we do the calculation, here's the atom, here's a wall atom. If we do the calculation now and wait a little bit, this atom has moved and now it's here. And therefore the calculation to be done at a second instant in time involves all of the pos atom positions being different than at the first instant in time. So you'd have to do the calculation again. Uh, and the uh, you might ask, well, gee, how far do atoms have to move? How long can you wait before things change significantly? And we can put in a number for that. A typical atomic velocity is 100 or 1,000 meters a second, depending on temperature. Atom-atom uh, interactions go out a few atomic distances, so they go out a few, a few angstroms, a few times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So if you wait 10 to the minus 13 or 10 to the minus 14 seconds, already the atoms have moved with respect to each other. So if I did do this calculation, the big calculation, it would only be valid for a few femtoseconds, and then I would have to try again. Yes? Now, of course, if you're clever, you say, well, gee, those are atoms. They obey the laws of mechanics. And you could say, um, maybe we have to use quantum mechanics, but if the atoms are anything other than helium, they're actually fairly heavy. And while you can worry about atomic diffraction issues, and Professor Zozulio will be happy to tell you about this, as a practical matter, if you said they approximately move via classical mechanics, this is not the end of the world. And therefore, I, if I say I know their positions and momenta at some given instant in time, momenta, if you prefer velocities, I can then integrate Newton's equations of motion. Now, I can't do it the way I did in Physics 1, where I just obtained analytic solutions. But if you say F equals MA, you can do a numerical integration where after a little bit the atom has moved from x to x plus v delta t. v has moved from v to v plus a delta t. You follow the two equations? And therefore, as time goes on, the atoms change position and velocities. If you actually want to do that integration, there are things that are a whole lot more sophisticated than what I just mentioned called symplectic integrators. Symplectic integrators, oh, look at the equivalent of looking at the first four derivatives, but they don't really, and are optimized so that energy is well conserved as opposed to the process I just described. If you use the process I just described, and try to persuade an, a planet to orbit around the sun, alarming things start happening very quickly. And if you try to do this, okay, I know what the sun is, I know what the mass of the earth is, I know what the mass of Mars is, I will put in the known orbital positions and velocities and integrate, and it looks like it's a nice integration with plenty of time steps, except somehow I don't remember Mars being ejected from the solar system every two years. And integrators that are not optimized can go very bad very quickly. This is a big research problem. So we could say we could integrate. Of course, to do that integration, it's sort of like the let's add up all the forces on the wall. But now we have to add up all of the forces, all of the atoms put on each other. That's much larger. And we have to do this every time step. To make life even more interesting, something that was not known when I was a little boy, but came out about the time I was a grad student. 
Suppose you're doing a numerical integration, and we could do the simple, we will not drop a molecular model on the floor, we will drop one of my books on the floor. So here is the book, and I drop it, and that's just G, motion at constant acceleration, exactly as you saw in Physics 1. Well, if you don't know exactly what G is in this room, and you put in a slightly wrong value of G, there will be a percent error small in the acceleration, and the time required to hit the floor will have a percent error, and the, there will be an error in the position of the book that grows quadratically in time. It grows as one-half error t squared, roughly speaking. Yes? And that is, that is a well-behaved problem in which the error grows as a polynomial in time. Unfortunately, about the time I was a grad student, Lev Sinai and several other people made an interesting observation about classical mechanics. And their observation was there are two sorts of problems. There are problems where the error grows as a polynomial in time, and there are problems where the error grows, roughly speaking, as an exponential in time. And so if you make a small error, instead of the error contributing quadratically, except you know, displacement also grew quadratically, so instead of the error in acceleration giving you a constant percent error in how far the thing has gone, this small error contributes exponentially. And suddenly, if you want to calculate twice or three or four times as far out in time, instead of needing to be make the error bars half or a third or a quarter as big, you need two or three or four times as many significant figures in your accuracy of your parameters. And very rapidly, the number of significant figures you need in the parameters gets very, very bad. Yes? <clears throat> this is called chaos. Chaos does not mean that the behavior of the system is not predictable. The system does behave under the laws of mechanics. The problem is that the error simply is very hard to control because it gets big. <coughs> so you can sort of imagine calculating the pressure on the gas in the room, and I have mentioned all of these annoying problems. And if you actually want to do this, now there's one other annoying problem. Does anyone think of another annoying problem? <coughs> 